read. Now to introduce today's speaker, there he is, the lovely Rod Fincham, Associate Professor at the University of Queensland. Now I'm going to hand the screen to you now while I continue this introduction. If you could accept the invitation to present there while I continue to babble away. Now Rod works mainly in quantitative field ecology and has veered into the Myrtle Rust space partly because one of his main motivations in life is to help species avoid extinction. Now this is a very good reason to get out of bed in the morning but given his talk title he seems to be up against it in Australia with this Myrtle Rust disease. Now Rod if you're all good to get underway there you can begin your presentation. Speaking of getting out of bed in the morning, um, good morning everyone. Uh, I live on my own so I'm not used to talking to anyone at this time of the day, uh, let alone an audience of people I can't see, but I'll carry on. Uh, carry so we, we've, we've had the benefit of some funding to look at uh, Myrtle Rust across its range in Australia and uh, the work was primarily conducted, but I just want to get rid of my screen, minimise it a bit. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, our mission was to do a broad assessment of the impacts of this new disease on the Australian rainforest Myrtaceae. We concentrated on the rainforest because we'd have enough indication over the last 10 years that these are where the species live that are likely to be in trouble. Um, the disease arrived in Australia in about 2010. Um, I think most of you probably know that history. So it had a, it's had a good chance to spread certainly up and down the East Coast and 10 years on was not a bad place to start to do this sort of broad assessment of its impacts. Uh, one of the technical problems is that the rainforest is a bit tricky, particularly the Myrtaceae in terms of identifying the things. So I needed a really um, committed field ecologist, um, field botanist to learn the flora and uh, get their head around that and um, most of the work was done by Julian Radford Smith who travelled up and down the east coast um, compiling information, goes into the rainforest and uh, meets the Myrtaceae and uh, has a systematic way of assessing the impacts of the disease. Come on. Uh, just have trouble in getting my next slide going for some reason. Rod, you may need to use your mouse and the mouse wheel. Uh, mouse. Yeah, I think yeah. you got the first slide now, haven't you? Yeah, we have, it's a tricksy thing. Yeah, cool. So here's a healthy Australian rainforest Myrtaceae at the top, um, but sadly, you're very hard pressed to see these beautiful leaves of this particular species looking so healthy anymore. They're much more likely to look like the bottom panel um, and the fruits and the um, flowers and the leaves get infected with this um, yellow uh, fungal rust when it's active. Um, most of the time you don't see the rust looking like this, you just see the impacts of it. Um, and um, it's more likely to look like the photo on the left. So lots of dead young branchlets and effectively the rust when it's severe um, inhibits the species from growing and if you can't grow you end up dying you're just not building enough carbohydrate reserves to persist and um, eventually you get major dry, die back like in the right hand photo and inevitably um, it's accompanied by the inability to reproduce so the flowers and the fruits are uh, uh, inviable and if yeah if they form at all they um, abort before they produce viable seed. So our system of assessing is based on the combination of the um, relatively short-term damage of the minor branches um, and then the bigger impacts of long-term damage which are seen by major branch deaths. So this was the, the best, best way of assessing the health of the populations rather than whether or not the rust was active on any particular day. And then we also kept a really cl close eye on whether or not we ever saw reproductive material on these things. And um, you know, you're pretty lucky to see reproductive material on Myrtaceae, uh, on these rainforest Myrtaceae at a, a random time. Um, 
but just knowing whether or not they were ever able to reproduce was obviously quite critical to our assessments. Okay, so there's um, Julian and other people's um, journeys up and down the east coast and the dots represent the populations that we assessed. Um, they coincide pretty closely with um, the distribution of, well, like that does represent the distribution of rainforest in Australia, those dots, um, and also to some extent the distribution of myrtle rust. So, uh, we've got 24,000 plant species in Australia, and in 200 years of throwing everything we can at this flora as Europeans, uh, agriculture, um, yeah, grazing, um, all the impacts that European settlement has wrought. Um, there's only about 12 species that we can definitely confirm are probably extinct. <laughs> and that comes from an assessment we did and published um, a couple of years ago. Um, so a lot of the species that are assumed to be extinct may still be lurking out there, um, haven't been properly surveyed, or they might be difficult taxonomic entities. And so, yeah, it's a pretty remarkable fact that there's only about 12 species that we can, you know, reasonably, um, reasonably with some reasonable certainty, we can consider are actually extinct. And, you know, that contrasts with our famous mammal extinction event, which has been far more dramatic. So the Australian flora is remarkably resilient, really. Um, and um, so on the back of these surveys um, of 1901 populations of 145 species, we can predict on the basis of the myrtle rust um, symptomology in the bush that 16 rainforest species are going to go extinct within a generation, so more than the entire period of European history. And how can we be so certain that those 16 species are going to go extinct? Well, um, they just can't grow. They, these, these species just can't grow. Um, there's very little um, evidence that there's resistant populations that can grow and reproduce. Um, yeah, so none of these species or do we see with um, producing viable seed in the bush. So if you can't grow and you can't reproduce, you die. And uh, this is a pretty amazing event, um, unprecedented probably globally, such a major extinction event in such a short period of time. The species that we've identified as the candidates to go extinct, we call category X. And as I said, there's 16 species, and there they are up and down the East Coast, spread out from uh, Northern New South Wales um, up to nearly the top of Cape York. Let's just have a quick look. Um, you don't need to remember all the names, of course. Um, and uh, But uh, there's some genera which are really preferentially affected. One of them's Gossia. Um, and uh, just a few images just to show you the symptomology. Yeah, these sort of, that's that top photo is very typical, sort of lots of dead young branches indicating the death of fresh growth in the last six to 12 months. Rhodamnia, another very important uh, fleshy fruited, fruited rainforest mertaceae with a uh, really high number of species that are on our category X list. That photo there in the middle is Rhodamnia arenaria, which is the northernmost one. It's um, up on Cape York. Another really important genus is Len Webia. It's a bit sad, but um, there's four species in Len Webia um, and two of them are undescribed. And both those undescribed species are um, about to go extinct and uh, so yeah these things are about to pop off the planet before we've ever even had a chance to name them. Another fleshy fruited um, Mertaceae. And then there's a bunch of other species that aren't in those genera. Uh, Rhodomertus is another fleshy fruited Mertaceae and then interestingly these other species, Ristantia and Backhousia are in a different, group, different tribe of the Myrtaceae that don't have fleshy fruit. So it's not only the fleshy fruit of Myrtaceae that are affected, but mostly it is. And, um, you know, Backhousia, for example, is quite a big genus with lots of species that don't seem to be dramatically affected, but one or two, and this one in particular, 
that is affected. Then we have a list of what we call category Y species, um, and they're species that are severely affected by myrtle rust, same symptomology, um, but there's some variability in the susceptibility, and occasionally we've seen fruit on these species, and we're just not really confident to say that they're um, going to be extinct in a generation. Um, and we need to watch these species before we can make a definite opinion about, uh, we'll form a definite opinion about their fate. But the important part about this list here is, you know, those same genera are popping up again. Gossia, Rhodamnia, Lenwebia, Rhodomotus. They're all fleshy fruited Myrtaceae. Um, and uh, it's an interesting fact that these things, these genera, um, Gossia, Lenwebia, Rhodamnia, Rhodomotus, and some of the others on that list too, Eugenia, Decaspermum, they're all in the tribe of the Myrtaceae called the Myrtiae. And having done a bit of reading, it appears that um, the fleshy fruited form of Myrtaceae has evolved twice. So there's two branches of the Myrtaceae which are uh, very unrelated. Um, with fleshy fruits. There's the Myrtiae and the Syzygiae. And um, the Syzygiae are not prominent on our list. Um, and the Myrtiae are very prominent on our list. So this probably just accentuates the fact that we're dealing with a naive host, you know, these, these particular branches of the Myrtaceae that haven't been exposed or uh, in their evolutionary history, haven't been exposed to this rust. And, um, the Syzygiae, which are more prominent in South America where the rust evolved, have some sort of residual resistance um, in their genetic history to the rust. Um, um, and uh, anyway, I could rave on about the parallels with COVID, but they're very obvious. You know, myrtle rust come out of the wild. Um, it's a novel organism affecting a naive host. And of course, there are new variants turning up all the time, which is a uh, Bit of concern. Biggest difference between COVID and myrtle rust is um, the species that COVID affects is not likely to go extinct, but a bunch of the things that are affected by myrtle rust are. So, what are we going to do about it? Um, this is a very important question. So, we um, uh, have set up some what we're calling rescue populations. So. Myrtle rust bait, number one candidate, or one of the number one candidates is this thing, the native guava. It's um, had a bit of attention. Um, it's really severely affected. It was a very common species within its range. And um, uh, yeah, if you had have told someone 20 years ago, this thing was um, about to crumple and die um, before our eyes, it would have been a hard thing to believe. Um, so common it was. Um, but that's what, exactly what's happened. This thing's um, completely collapsed. It's just, um, you know, residual population suckering from root suckers. So we dug up some root suckers. We um, kept them alive with fungicide and we planted them on the edge of the range of myrtle rust to the west of Brisbane. You can see that little square. Um, so you can see that's pretty much the edge of where the rainforest occurs. Uh, in near the in a place called Highfields, and Highfields has about 916 millimetres of rainfall. Brisbane, which is a, a myrtle rust hotspot, has about 1,100 millimetres of rainfall. So a little bit drier than Brisbane. We set up these gardens, and then quite a bit drier than uh, Brisbane in the town of Pittsworth, um, further to the west, out on this um, rainfall gradient heading west from Brisbane. A um, couple of years later, the trees at Highfields have grown quicker than the ones at Pittsworth. Pittsworth is a tough site, being drier. Um, and um, so the trees grew quicker at Highfields, no surprise there, but they just get slammed by the rust. So they had an attempt to flower, but they were completely rusted, as you can see in that image. All the shoots were burnt. And at Pittsworth, uh, we seem to be beyond the limits of myrtle rust, so no signs of the disease out there, even though it's a bit tougher for these things to grow. They've been well looked after by a team out there. Um, they need, do need to be watered regularly. It's not 
sort of rainforest country um, and uh, um, they, um, if you water them they'll survive and no sign of the rust. Um, this is a bit of work done by a student of mine, Natalie Meekle John. We decided to look at, to choose a species with a really broad range, um, a, a broad environmental envelope, um, to look at the environmental limits of the disease, to learn more about the environmental limits of the disease. It's called Trist Aniopsis sexuiflora. It's an extremely common species on every, any um, uh, sort of, most of the any, well, any um, rapidly flowing, flowing stream in the wet tropics or Cape York, you'll run into this species. So it's really easy to survey. You just turn up at a river crossing and there it will be. And um, it has a broad environmental envelope spanning from sort of Townsville in North Queensland all the way nearly to the tip of Cape York. So a big range of rainfall and temperature environments. And um, Natalie generated really fantastic results, really clear. Uh, showing that uh, myrtle rust on this species anyway in that environment, in that tropical environment, runs out of steam between about 1500 and 2000 millimetres rainfall. And also it seems to run out of steam um, when the temperature, the mean maximum temperature gets over about 32 degrees. So um, that coincides with um, uh, Myrtle rust will be perfectly happy in the wet tropics environment in, the, in our tropical rainforest, but it will be less comfortable up on the tip of Cape York or in Darwin, for example. Um, this species doesn't come further south, so we can't say about uh, the, prefer the, the, cold, the cold limit of myrtle rust as you're heading south, um, but certainly it's perfectly comfortable um, infecting its hosts um, all the way down to Sydney at least. So some really clear results, uh, sort of confirming the experimental evidence that have been done in uh, controlled environments about the environmental limits of the disease. And that um, points to some possible sites where we might be able to rescue these things. Townsville is an obvious candidate. You can see by the shape of the Australian coast that Townsville misses out on that uh, moist southeasterly wind colliding with, um, colliding with the um, mainland. And so it's quite a bit drier than Cairns, um, about 1500 mil. Myrtle rust is in Townsville, but only just. It turns up in nurseries, not in gardens. Uh, there's been a few little uh, residual um, sightings of it out in the bush, but not very much. This gentleman here is uh, Brandon Espy. He's going to be a big part of the rescue effort. Fantastic guy. Um, he's the head gardener at um, James Cook University in Townsville. They've got a wonderful grounds there and it's Brandon's mission to rescue these things and get them planted out in uh, at James Cook University. And um, uh, the it seems to be a really good spot. Townsville seems to be a really good spot to rescue these things. And um, so Brandon's busy generating cut, cuttings and growing, getting any seed that he possibly can and growing things uh, and putting them out there and so far he's had really good progress and at least getting them planted around the gardens of James Cook University. Uh, back to Pittsworth, I was there just a couple of weeks ago and mass flowering of the guava. So that was really exciting to see, you know, the, the un, uninfected flowers of the guava just as they would have 10, 15 years ago. And I'll eagerly await to see whether we get, can get some uh, mature fruit and, and some seed from um, those populations because there's no way you get them from the wild. They haven't been seen fruiting for a long time. This is uh, Rhodamnia rubescens um, fruiting in, in um, Melbourne, um, where I'm from. So I was taking my mum for a walk around the gardens in, in, in a suburb of Melbourne. And there this thing was with um, beautiful mature fruit, collected them this last Christmas and sent them to my mate Spencer Shaw who runs a nursery at the back of Mullaney and is also really committed to being part of the rescue effort for myrtle rust. And, and this is a seedling tray that Spencer grew and he can really see some variation in the resistance when you grow the seedlings. So we're hopeful that um, uh, we might be able to find some resistance by growing mass growing of the plants. The big, big limiting factor is trying to find the fruit. So yeah, you need to go to places beyond the range of the rust 
um, to do that. Um, but here's my backyard in Brisbane. Um, the um, rather unusual sort of concept of my backyard gardening. I'm not much of a gardener, but uh, in my backyard in Brisbane is these species that are about to go extinct. So I've got, I think I've got about 11 of the 16 growing in, growing in my backyard. And um, uh, there's plenty of active rust in Brisbane. Brisbane just gets slammed with rust every year whenever the weather conditions are, correct, are right for it. And uh, I've just given these a really sparing um, treatment of bifidan uh, just once, one application soon after I planted them when I settled them in. And that plant in the foreground is Len Webbia species main range, which is absolutely smashed in the field. Um, um, it grows on the top of the cliffs um, in around the scenic rim, rim of um, well, the, what we call the border ranges between New South Wales and Queensland, and uh, it's 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 kind of a fairly rare plant to start with. So unlike the guava, which was extremely common and had a bit of a head start, Len Webbia species main range is quite a restricted species, and it's probably the one that's going to pop off first. It's just um, really devastating to see those dead populations. Um, and um, people who are doing similar sort of rescue work in New South Wales have done a great job growing uh, lots of the population, rescuing lots of the populations and growing them from cuttings. And uh, Russell Coston at Limpenwood Nursery has been a fantastic um, person involved in this. And uh, he, he gave me this plant. And um, yeah, with just a light spray, spraying of bifidan in my backyard in Brisbane, it's grown like a rocket and um, no sign of rust. So I'm starting to get the impression that you don't, you know, you don't need, um, you can have quite modest and mild um, fungicide treatments to deflect the disease. This is um, a plant of Gossia hillii. This is a category X species. This is a plant growing in a bit of bushland uh, in Brisbane, so not in my garden. This is a wild plant and I, took it upon myself to give this plant in the bush a light spraying of bifidan and lo and behold this photo was taken yesterday um, the fruits are hanging in there and um, I'm hopeful to get Spencer a batch of this seed when they ripen up around Christmas and um, and again Spencer will grow the plants and we can hopefully find some resistant individuals so in conclusion the yeah, unprecedented extinction event about to happen in Australia with uh, a novel organism um, and a um, naive hosts. Can't help think, thinking that there's gonna be more of this in the future um, with globalization and, um, and all the things that prosper that sort of circumstance. Uh, we've got at least another 20 species that we're worried about. Many more species in Australia are affected by the disease, but um, yeah, not to the not to the extent of these um, rainforest motaceae, and um, to avoid total extinction, the strategies we need to engage in, I believe, are both in situ and ex, ex situ. So in situ in the bush treatment with fungicide. There's very few. There's none of these um, 16 species that are naturally occupying environments that are free of myrtle rust. Otherwise, they wouldn't be on the list. And uh, so the only way you can get them to fruit in the, in the, in the wild is to apply some fungicide. I think we need to play with that, understand the treatments, get to know the symptomology better so that we can refine that. But ultimately, um, that strategy and ex situ re rescue, planting them beyond the range of the disease and then planting them within the range of the disease and applying fungicide, anything we need to do to get um, uh, seed. We can grow them from cuttings, um, but they're not myrtle rust resistant strains that will be growing from cuttings. And uh, so we need to grow seedlings to screen for that resistance and uh, 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 build those um, ex situ populations of resistant plants prior to rewilding. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Rod, for that excellent, if rather sobering talk. <clears throat> um, 
a really clear example, I guess, of the disease triangle and the interactions between environment, plant and pathogen being um, what drives what we see. Oh, sorry, I hope I didn't cut, cut you off there before you did your acknowledgements. Did you have anything further to say about all that, uh, those fabulous people that helped make this work happen? Absolutely, yeah. I just, I just wanted to highlight this is, this is um, a whole bunch of people working together um, and here they are. So thanks to everyone who's been involved. Very good. So we'll, we'll take some questions now. And um, for those of us watching from New Zealand, I've got more of a comment here. I'm just going to read it out. It might help some of you um, get in the picture here. Our Lophomyrtus, which has been the most vulnerable genus here so far, is grouped with Lenwebia and other Myrti tribe members. As a result, we may assume that Lophomyrtus may become extinct within a generation if we don't preserve it in, in botanical garden conditions. So certainly lots of lessons to be learned from New Zealand. Um, I do have some questions, so I'll, I'll read them out, but um, do feel free to put them in question box. Uh, audience members. Now, how many gennets, um, excuse my pronunciation there if I've got that wrong, survive in the high fields and Pittsworth plantings? Um, we planted um, 40 individuals at both sites. Nearly all the trees survived at high fields. This is the site where they've been infected. And uh, a lot of the trees did die at Pittsworth. Tough place, frosty, frosty, hot, dry winds. Um, really quite different from the environments where the guava grows naturally. Um, so despite the best efforts to keep them alive with, with watering when they needed it, we lost a few and we're down to 26. But yeah, as I said, I saw those plants in the last couple of weeks and they look terrific. Yeah. It really is a bit of a, I don't know if triage is the right word, situation, isn't it? Um, with some of these species. Now we have a question here about collaboration. Um, there is certainly plenty of collaboration going on between Australian and New Zealand researchers, but this person wants to know if you're working with researchers in New Zealand. Are you part of any of our efforts here at the moment? Only in a sort of planning way. We had a really constructive planning meeting with um, some of the Myrtle West researchers. And um, yeah, I think we agreed that um, refining the application of fungicides and how we how we can minimise, you know, obviously spraying fungicides around the bush not a very cool thing to do. So, yeah, minimising uh, the impact and uh, mod and uh, developing our application strategies, I think, was a priority that we arrived on, and we need to keep talking. Uh, the other thing that's come out of a uh, um, synergy with New Zealand is um, the um, desire to go to New Caledonia springboard across to New Caledonia to do similar sort of work over there um, uh, because they've got a very susceptible um, flora full of endemics and um, yeah probably the next the next part of the world that we need to be most worried about. For sure now we have something here I'm not sure it's it's a conundrum it's almost a little bit of a moral question rather than a research question, but we'll we'll have a quick crack at it. How do you account for risk in terms of a widespread species versus extinction? Should a rare species be valued more than an abundant one due to higher probability of extinction compared with high impact? I guess they're wondering how do you prioritise perhaps with limited resources? Yeah, fair question, I reckon. Um... Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of, I'm talking, I'm preaching to the converted here, aren't I? I don't need to convince people that extinction's not really that cool. Um, <laughs> but, you know, for a broader audience, we do. We do need to explain why extinction is um, something that we should care about. Um, and that that uh, is always, you know, ground for a really fruitful discussion, isn't it? Why, why do we do what we do and why do we care? And and it's highlighted in this situation because they're quite obscure little Myrtaceae species hidden away in the rainforest, many of which have only been described in the last few decades. So, so yeah, if they went extinct, you know, I don't know what the consequences would be, maybe not much. Um, but I think extinction is in, extremely profound and as a conservation scientist, I think philosophically it's the, the main game. So when it comes to triaging or prioritising um, species faced with extinction, I don't think we need to do that. I think we should be making all efforts to make sure we can rescue uh, these 16 species that we've identified 
as about to uh, pop off the perch. And um, the program for doing that is um, is difficult. It's a difficult road, and you know the concept of rewilding these things. It's quite slow growing species actually in the bush. Um, you know, it's a long term project, but it is absolutely doable, and um, and you know will involve um, generations of people long after we're gone. Um, uh, but I think people do care about extinction, and I, I think um, it's a really, really worthy thing to be doing, and and will involve the gauge, engagement of uh, all sorts of people. You know, particularly nurserymen, particularly people who like gardening. So it's a it's a very inclusive. It's going to be in a very inclusive process, not just involving being um, conservation scientists. Yeah, I, I can certainly see a wide role there that even the public could play if the just resources uh, were made available to coordinate that. So we do have some more uh, research-based questions now. Can you clarify the rainfall tolerances or preferences for myrtle rust for the pathogen? Uh, I can say a little bit more about that. So yeah, in the tropics, it looks pretty clear from Natalie's work and um, just you know what's happening in Townsville that in the tropics you come down to 1500 millimetres rainfall and you're pretty safe. So somewhere between 2000 and 1500, the impact of the disease diminishes quite steeply. Um, and now because of lower evaporation rates, when you come into the subtropics, that threshold's gonna be lower. And it is indeed low. We can see that with the guava gardens at high fields, you know, 900's not enough. You need to get lower than that. Um, and it, I guess it's it, it's probably no surprise or accident that the limits of the disease pretty pretty act closely correspond with the limits of rainforests in Australia. And of course, um, the susceptibility of any individual host is going to play into that as well. Uh, um, yeah, thanks for reminding me about that because. Um, you know, the model Natalie's work would suggest that you know motor rust is running out of steam up on Cape York, uh, and it probably is, or it is running out of steam. Yet we have one of the Category X species living up there, and so just because the disease is running out of steam, if you've got a highly susceptible host, they can still be in a lot of trouble. That's right. Now we have a few. Uh, thank you very much and great talk, Rod. So some en encouragement and enthusiasm there for the audience. Has there been range-wide screening of seedlings for variation and susceptibility in the category X species? Gosh, with so many species, it's going to be a challenge, isn't it? Yeah, no, the challenge is not the number of species. We we can do that. The challenge is getting the fruit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, by definition, so ha has it been done? Like, to what extent has that been done? It needs to be. We need to get really organised and get cranking with it. So we need to be um, doing the sorts of the, the little things that I just showed you in the last few slides. You know, just so piecemeal. It's just me playing around with a little bottle of fungicide, spraying a few plants in the bush, you know. Um, I'm not even a gardener and I'm having a go in my backyard to get some things fruiting and seeding. We've got one little rescue garden out at, out at Pittsworth that hopefully might produce some seed. We've got really enthusiastic uh, nurserymen who shouldn't be expected to do this work for nothing. You know, they need government assistance, so we need to be putting some money in their pockets. Um, and we all need to be working frantically to get these things to produce fruit, deliver it to the nurserymen, and get them organised um, or, or, or uh, to screen seedlings. You know, that little seedling tray of red amnia rubescens grown by Spencer on the fruit that I got from Melbourne, you know, that's not happening all over the country. That's just a one off, you know, and these nurserymen would love to be growing these things, um, but there's no seed. Yeah, interesting. One can certainly see your core motivation simply let's prevent extinction uh, coming through here in your papers and in what you're really focusing your time and effort on and, and what really is perhaps a crisis for many species. Uh, next question, has there been an effort to look at whether any Category X species have traditional cultural uses? Uh, and if so, have Aboriginal communities been engaged with in Queensland to manage them? Great question. Um, yep, we've made, some, made a start with that. Um, well, first up, the first part of the question, they're fleshy-fruited 
species that um, are slow growing. I alluded, I alluded to their slow growth. Um, and they're not generally the biggest trees in the rainforest, which do tend to be the faster growing things. They're slow growing, shade tolerant, um, not all of them shade tolerant. Some of them grow on the edge of the rainforest. Yeah, a mixture there. Um, but some of them are slow growing and um, fleshy fruited. So they're all bush tucker. You'll get a little, a little yeah. bush lolly out of all of these things. Uh, the, the native guava is a good tucker, and uh, some of them are, some of them are a bit dry. So they would have been a bit dry, but still edible. And uh, they all would have been um, used by Aboriginal people. They all would have had um, indigenous names, although we haven't been able to track that down for all of these species um, yet. Um, and also, they are called commonly mallet woods which refers to the fact because they're slow growing, they have this really hard timber. So they would have had uses as tools, you know, maybe digging tools um, uh, due to, by virtue of the fact that they're the hard wood. Um, and um, I've, um, we need to do more in the Indigenous engagement space um, and, um, and we will be doing more. And, you know, I've had meetings with, um, uh, Indigenous ranger teams, and they're really keen to get involved. So they'll be they'll be no doubt part of the solution as well. That, that's great to hear. And on that note, we've had a couple of people uh, suggesting looking into in vitro cultures, tissue cultures. Is that something that could form part of your approach to species that's salvation? As well. that, that's okay. happening as well. I should, have, I should have acknowledged the team. There, there are people um, so. You know, I'm based in Queensland and uh, to some extent we're parochial, uh, particularly uh, through this pandemic uh, in relation to the states. Um, but um, I recognise that people in New South Wales, even though they've got less Category X species down there, have been more actively involved. And um, part of their involvement is um, getting cuttings from all the populations and getting, and getting developing tissue culture across all the populations in New South Wales. So we certainly need to be doing more of that in Queensland, although in my opinion, the secret is to get the genetic variation that you get with seed. Very good, very good. Uh, right, now I see a few people drifting off and we will need to wrap this up soon. I'm just gonna ask you there for a couple more questions uh, and then we're gonna be Moving on with our day, uh, someone has uh, let me know they've had some issues with joining. Will the slides be available? The, the slides certainly will be available to everyone who registered uh, in a couple of days and then to the world on YouTube, uh, probably from early next week. So just a couple of things to finish on here. Do we know of any invertebrates that are 100% reliant on those species at risk? There's a paper on that. Uh, I can't tell you what it says, but there's a paper on the things that are reliant on the native guava. It's published in a journal, Australian journal called Cunninghamia. So check it out on the web. Um, yeah, and I, other than that, I'm not, I'm not aware of anything else for the other species. That sounds like an excellent reference there. Um, and to some extent, I, I think we have talked a little bit um, about this person's kind of question, but Perhaps a brief revisit would be appropriate to wrap up. What's the model in Australia to enable ex situ conservation to happen in the Myrtle Rust context? Uh, something we can learn from in New Zealand is not much ex situ conservation is happening yet with Myrtaceae. I, I guess it's just a combination of the kinds of things you've already been talking about, um, but unfortunately at the moment somewhat ad hoc, at least from your perspective. Yeah, so just, just a bit of well, my advice for what it's worth. Like, you know, you've got to do this work first. Um, you know, the work, I think this is just the fundamental foundation, get a really good handle on what the disease is doing in the bush and how it's affecting species. You know, if you're not, if you, if you don't have species on category X in New Zealand, then you haven't got as big a problem as we have, and you won't be leaning so heavily towards ex situ uh, rescue. Um, so, um, I, I'm not sure how you go going in New Zealand with that basic survey work, but my advice would be to, you know, like make sure you complete that before you, before you think of a strategy. So we're now just coming out of that phase. We have identified the things we need to worry about and um, we need to take lessons from New Zealand because you guys just take this thing so much more seriously than we do in terms of funding and um, getting organised. Um, 
uh, given the magnitude of the impact, uh, the relative magnitudes of the impact. You know, it's pretty pretty nasty here in Australia. We now know that. And um, it's pretty piecemeal, our response, particularly in Queensland. So there's a, a, a scope for a team of people to be working on this. I think you can see the magnitude of the problem um, requires that. And at the moment, we don't have a designated metal rust officer, not one, in Queensland. So, um, but, we're, but I think we're ready to go. We're well equipped with information and knowledge and capacity um, and people who want to be involved and engaged. And so we need, really need to get our act together in 2022. For sure, and I'm, I'm afraid, yes, we're all doing our best down here at the moment with resources available, but um, the surveying and or monitoring could perhaps be described as piecemeal uh, at best unfortunately here as well. I do wonder though um, to what extent this, that your work has been a snapshot in time and species could move into categories we don't want to see them in uh, as spore loading in the environment increases or do you feel like you've got a fairly good handle now on how things are going to play out over say the next decade? Uh, look, yeah it'll, it'll change and there'll be some surprises I'm sure but I do, do get the impression that spore loads are really significant and so uh, given that so many things have died, like big trees have died, and there would have been choppers with you know massive spore loads associated with these big trees, I'm assuming the spore loads in the bush have declined, and so that might just give some of these things a bit of a bit of a reprieve. I'm not sure, uh, but you might expect that. Um, uh, but then you know there are there are uh, you know, new variants. We've heard about the South African variant, and, and you know eucalypts that aren't affected terribly severely uh, in South America suddenly being affected by new variants. So, you know, what the future holds in terms of the evolution of this rust is um, yeah, anyone's guess. For sure. All right. Well, that's it for today. Thank you very much, Rod, for your presentation. And as I mentioned, a video of today's webinar will be made available on the Beyond Myrtle Rust website. Uh, probably by early next week and it's emailed uh, as well every time we do these sessions to everyone who registered. Now Myrtle Rust never sleeps but I do so we will be taking a break in January and then the Myrtle Rust webinar series will be back in February, Wednesday, February 9th to be precise at least uh, in New Zealand time, same place, same time and we'll be hearing from the Stewart Lab at Colorado State University in lovely Fort Collins probably be very snowy there uh, at that time. And lab members there are part of a collaboration developing a test that will identify the different strains of Australopithecinia obsidii. So a bit of a practical tool there, we hope, to keep an eye out for those different strains that you mentioned, Rod, uh, as we wrapped up today. Until then, an early Merry Christmas, everyone. And a big thank you to all of our speakers from this year and to all of our lovely audience members as well. I will see you all in the new year.